Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm so happy to have John Halleck uh, uh, here to uh, share with us his insight about communication. Uh, we know how important that is. Maybe I can do a quick introduction before I go with all my question. Uh, is that John is now is the senior vice president of communication at Transcaring, and before that, he's also holding the same role at Livongo. As you all know, Livongo had a very successful IPO, and also later on was acquired uh, or merged with uh, Teladoc for a one of the biggest amount in the history of digital health. So um, John had a lot of role in telling that story and then creating that, uh, that helped uh, getting the IPO, the successful IPO and successful um, merger. And so before like uh, Livango, he also have done a lot of other work in the previous digital health space. He was at Care Cloud, he was at Improvada, and you know he helped the companies that he worked for uh, at uh, uh, Care Cloud, not Cloud Care, Care Cloud, uh, uh, make it to the the company uh, Inc. 500 and Forbes magazine lists of America's most promising company. So I think we would be lucky to have John in our team because that he can bring you up to that next level there. And John has also received many many national awards. Uh, one of them is the PR from the PR Week, PR Daily Magazine, and the Saber Saber Awards. And so, with that, I let's let's get this started. So, Great. anyhow, um, I thought it would be interesting uh, for us to you know start with the conversation about how you end up you know doing a PR. I mean, it's interesting mm. your career. You, you were like, a, you wanted to be a professional golfer at some point. Yeah. Somehow make the change. How's that? Yeah. Well, first, uh, Christine, great to be here. And uh, thank you and, and uh, UCFF and the, and the Rosamond uh, Institute. I, uh, I'm a big fan of you and your work. And uh, I tune in all the time to your, to your uh, various content interviews. So uh, it's a, it's a blast to be here, but, um, and I'm excited to talk to everyone listening in. Um, so your question on how I got into PR. Yeah, I went to, uh, believe it or not, I went to college on a golf scholarship many years ago. And I think if you had asked the 19, 20 year old me what I was going to do, uh, I was going to go and uh, be on the PGA tour and, and be a millionaire. Uh, and then after a few years and playing against uh, some really good players, I, I, I figured out pretty quick that I needed to get a job. And, uh, and my coach said, you know, you need to pick a major. And I picked uh, communications, uh, mainly because it had probably had the least amount of math requirements. Uh, <laughs> right. So um, and from there, I was lucky. I, um, I came into PR, you know, let's call it right at around 2000, 2001. And I was in Boston. And, um, you know, when I went into the agency world, I envisioned that as kind of consumer centric brands, right? And, and healthcare and healthcare technology, what it was called then, wasn't something that was on my radar. But I got thrust onto those kinds of accounts. Uh, and they weren't really the, the sexy accounts, you know, at the, at the agencies I was at. But it was a perfect storm at that time because you had some efforts by the administration. Uh, in that period of time, you had David Brailler ascending as the, as the, the first uh, kind of ONC czar. And so you had all these initial companies, uh, like in the electronic health record space, the practice management space. And one of the companies you, you left out at the beginning was, you know, where I, where I really got into this was, was Athena Health. Mm -hmm. So I was a very, very young guy. And, and um, you know, Jonathan Bush and Todd Park, who were the founders of Athena, brought me in uh, pre-IPO to get the communications infrastructure in place to not only bolster the awareness of the company, because it, as hard as it may be for people to appreciate now, no one had heard of Athena Health uh, at that time. And we were up against some very large incumbents uh, that were selling software. And we weren't selling software. We were using this thing called the internet. And we thought it was going to be big. We thought it was going to make it. And we thought you could offer a doctor um, the, the tools for him or her to run their office and their staff 
without paying a lot of money up front. And so that's really how I, how I got into to PR from the agency world early on and then in-house at Athena. And we obviously had a, a great run through that IPO and, and then subsequent mergers and the growth of the company and really tried to usher in the, the idea of uh, certainly in the provider space, paying for the result of technology, right? It wasn't about who had the best software. Uh, it was about, you know, did the doctor get paid? Was their practice operating better? And if we could use PR and communications as a way to drive the conversation there, then it was not going to be about, was it all scripts or Cerner or next gen or eClinical works that had the best drop down menus and clickety clicks. Um, and from there, you know, I, I, um, I went on to a few of those other companies you mentioned, but, but the, the correlation between them all was each one of them was trying to create their own category, right? And, and all the CEOs that I've, I've worked for and, and leaders in those companies, uh, I've been fortunate in that for the most part, um, all of them appreciated the, the role that communications can play in the scaling and strategy of a company. Uh, relative to its market. Um, and so certainly that was true most recently at Livongo and, and here at Transparent where, and we'll get more into this obviously, but um, the idea of now there's a litany of digital health solutions, right? There isn't a day that goes by that someone isn't getting funding or there isn't consolidation. Uh, and so it's no longer a conversation of are digital health solutions viable? It's now, if you're the employer, Right. And you're trying to figure out how to offer these solutions and how in the best way to do that to your populations. And, and there's a financial and a clinical outcome. How do you drive towards that? And so that that is that's really an experience mm -hmm. topic. Right. It's now how do you provide an experience to your to your uh, employees and in turn the consumer? So um, that's our next challenge and, and certainly been busy trying to communicate that. Yeah, no, I've seen, I've been following Transcaring a lot. But before I jump into the next question, just I've uh, I just got reminded that uh, feel free to ask any question along the way, and I will be checking our Q and A box. Uh, so we'll take some of the question uh, from you, the audience, uh, and then share uh, share that with John. So many of our uh, listeners here uh, are entrepreneurs and startups, and people uh, wants to know, it's like, when is the right time for a startup to tell their story so that more people knows about them? Like, you know, when is, you know, when is the big, the, what moment do you pick to tell your story? It's a great question. And, and, and what I would immediately say back to that is it certainly all depends on the kind of company, you know, the, the regulatory environment you're in, you, you know, there could be folks on this call that are in the, the, the medical device or the, the pharmaceutical biotechnology industry. So that's a little bit different maybe than, than the healthcare IT space. But I absolutely think the, the macro message there is, is least amount of time as possible. Um, you know, there, there's no uh, shortage in any industry of people trying to uh, tell a story, right? And what you don't wanna find yourself in is you've waited to when you think things are almost perfect to start to tell your story because uh, more times than not, in my experience, someone's already told your story for you and it may not be what you want. Um, so the, the, it's about speed, Christine. It, the, the, there's always a strategy where, and there's product development and all those things that have to happen in a company, any company. And the time between that to where it's viable, right? And when you start communicating who you are, what you do and how you help uh, has to be as short as possible. Um, and so there's probably a long, long list of companies that were well-intentioned, had great ideas um, and that you and I have never heard of because they probably waited. And all those other companies I've worked for, like I said earlier, they appreciated the fact that they didn't have the luxury to wait to try to inject themselves into the conversation that was going on pertaining to their, to their business. Um, you know, Improvada is a good example. Uh, and I'm gonna try to use a lot of examples here because that's how I learn. Um, Improvada was a company that, you know, you had all these, these years of, of trying to get doctors and hospitals to adopt electronic health records, 
And that has essentially happened. And it was a long slog, as you know, right? But then you had this issue of access that if you were a nurse or you were a doctor, uh, you had anywhere from 12 to 15 passwords that you had to remember on a communal laptop, right? That, that's not scalable. And they had a technology that allowed someone to do that from a single sign-on standpoint. They, they had waited a number of years to tell that story. And so they weren't part of the conversation of, of how they were going to help be the solution for doctors and nurses to actually use these technologies that the industry had spent so many years trying to drive adoption on. And so they had to really quickly uh, work to, to, to tell their story fast. So not only investors, but their, their clients and, and prospects understood the critical role they played. So that's an example of a company that caught on to it and, and they weren't too late, but they had, they had waited. Right. Mm -hmm. And and if they hadn't, maybe maybe the company could have scaled even faster and they ended up being successful. But that's a that's a lesson learned. And that's really uh, was a credit to their to their CEO, a man named Omar Hussein, who who really understood that. He said, you know, we have not been telling our story. Um, and and I think you see that with with startups that are savvy. That can seize the day, Athena being a good example. Right. If 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 you go back and you look at uh, some of the things Athena did, the day we announced that we had an electronic health record, Christine, we had five doctors using it, five, right? Mm -hmm. But if we did not announce that, the world was gonna pass us by, right? So, so you know, there is a fine line between hype and also trying to have audiences understand from a vision standpoint, where you're trying to go as a company, right? And, and then yes, you're gonna have to work very hard to, to fill that reality and that vision. But, but uh, I would go back to, to the advice I would give folks from a comm standpoint is to truncate the amount of time between you know, a viable product or solution and when you start communicating to the market about it. Yeah, I mean- What's, what's the worst that can happen, right? What is, yeah, so, you know, um, I, this the the communication telling the story not only uh help you get adoption but it's also help you get investors yeah. I mean, listening to what you're saying about you know your experience uh in helping the story of Livongo doing that ipo it reminds me of my time when we were at hartport mm -hmm. that was many years ago i think what they did a good job in you know telling the story and at that time there's another competitor probably they don't have that much publicity, their share price did not go up as much as Hartford. I mean, that was a different story why they end up not doing well. It's more like the, you know, has nothing to do with um, the hype. I mean, they, they did a good job in hyping it up and attract a lot of investors. And what you're saying is that make sure when you create all the communication, the story, you also back it up with. Well, yeah, that's the risk, right? Is it, and, and I haven't had too much of that in my career, but you're always telling, let's call it a six month story, right? You're out six months. And if you don't do that, you're either not in deals or, or you're, you're, you're potentially losing opportunities and PR can act as that, that differentiator. But yes, you then have to work very hard to execute and fulfill that. And if you don't, then, then you're going to have to deal with that. Um, but I think a lot of companies also, and you, I know you're from your time at Amazon, um, you realize this, that, that if, you, if you plant the flag, right, to your teams, your product teams, your business development teams, whoever it may be, well, that gives them a target. And once it's out and you can use PR in, in, in this way, um, it's, it's almost acts as an internal motivator for your teams to go in and make the, the dream a reality. Um, and again, the flip side to that, like anything in life is if you don't, yeah, you're going to have to deal with with that reality. Right. So There's lots of examples of that. So yeah. a good comms person has to weigh that, right? You have to, and, and, and unfortunately, you probably only get that through experience to say, when is the time to pull the trigger on this and really announce this? Because I think there is a really strong opportunity um, that we're going to actually execute on this. And we don't end up having a really awkward moment that we didn't, I mean, it's certainly a completely different animal when you're public. And, and we can chat about that. But um, when you're private, you've got to, you've got to get in the game. And, um, and, and that would be, uh, 
you know, my, my advice on that. Yeah, so I mean, uh, going back to the Amazon, I think yeah. what, we, what John is referring to, I think that at Amazon, they always start with the press release, what the press yeah. is going to say, and then come back and then, you know, reverse engineer it and then develop the product, which I think was a good time to answer one of the questions uh, sure. from our listener here from Seth Harrington. And he, the question that he has is, in your opinion, uh, what is a what is your opinion of buying periodic formal press releases versus posting more frequent updates on to the social medias? Oh, that's great. That's a real tactical question. And um, I just want to go back to the, your press release. I don't answer that in a sec, but the um, the kind of the, my second in command at Lamongo was uh, was uh, a guy named Jake Mazanki, really really talented uh, professional, and he would probably laugh at that question because we would write press releases, Christine for things that we thought might happen that never saw the light of day because you'd always start with the headline, the subhead and, and how you envisioned that. And we would, we would laugh amongst the team of, you know, we'd write, we'd put the cycles in to write a piece of news that we, we may never see the light of day. But, but to that other question, if you're a, if you're a, a real startup, right. And you, and you look at the cadence of news you may have in a quarter or a year, yeah, it may not make sense to have a, a formal um, a formal uh, wire agreement if you're not putting out 10, 12, 15 or more press releases a year. Now, the trick is, is it's a double edged sword there. Right. So if you don't, if you don't have the engagement in the media coverage where people are actually engaging with your social media platforms, then just using that as a way to distribute news may not be that effective because you need the press coverage and maybe a more formal press release to start getting that you know, that drumbeat of coverage, which then feeds the social media channels, which is then becoming a viable uh, communication platform. Um, and so I would think it, depending on the kind of news you have, certainly a funding announcement, something like that. Yeah, you'd want to formally announce that via a press release, business wire, PR newswire, golden newswire, something like that. But they do get expensive, right? I mean, it's not something you worry about as you're kind of an upstart or, or a company that's scaling, getting towards an IPO or certainly public, I mean, that's required. But um, yeah, I mean, you would have to weigh that, but but I want to stress that that social media platforms are only truly effective as communication platforms if they are things that people are actually engaging with, um, right? So the content that goes into that uh, needs to be content that people finds useful. Otherwise, putting news out through it, you know, outside of your own internal teams, I don't know who's reading it. Maybe your family members things like that. But, um, you know, you want to find, and certainly when you're, when you're starting out, you want to find the, the, the conduit that's going to reach the most people. Right. And I think that's, it, that's the, cha the challenge and also the opportunity with the, so the social media. I mean, 20 years ago. You build it into your budget. It's 1500 bucks. I think it's like, I, I don't know what it is these days. It's like $400. And then it's like a hundred bucks for every X number of words after that. So Right. more motivation for very, very short press release. Right. So that's what you can tell your internal teams. Listen, we need to keep this under 600 words because it gets expensive. Right. There you go. Right. So use yeah. that as a tool internally. Like our, our boreal place should only be this long because if it goes any longer, it's expensive. <laughs> so I've been following a lot of the uh, media, uh, the publicity, the social media on transparent. And my question is to what extent is like too much publicity? I mean, do you worry about that or is always there's no such thing as too much publicity? Great question. Uh, it's like the age old question. Um, there is there is too much publicity. Uh, let me tell you about a mistake I made years ago. Um, when I was at Athena Health uh, and I was younger and and we we had Jonathan Bush, who was, you know, an extremely charismatic and media friendly uh, executive. And you can become enamored with that um, because it opens up opportunities to do so much TV, other forms of broadcast, business press. And you have to, you have to measure the brand of an executive or, or some, some SME and the brand of the company, right? And, and, and you don't know what you don't know when you're younger. And I probably would have played that differently. Um, and, and, but I also look at it as... We, we needed people to pay attention to us. Mm -hmm. And um, and he certainly helped with that. 
I think now you want to you want to figure out, especially as a newer company, what levers you have available to pull from an awareness standpoint and from a content generation standpoint. So you can ratchet that up and you can ratchet that down and you can ratchet that up. And I'll, I'll bring it back to um, Lavongo. We had created an engine, right? From a content standpoint, where we had our traditional PR, our earned media, right? We had our own media and then our social and, our, and, and, and then our events. And we could, we could ramp that up, Christine, depending on what we wanted to talk about at a level that our competition simply could not. And that was a strategic advantage, but we were also mindful, right? Of how much we did that. And, and if things were going on in the world or, or, or for other factors, we wanted to throttle that down. But you first have to figure out, you know, what the engine can do, right? You know, otherwise you're just looking at the car in the, in the garage saying, well, I don't know how fast it can go. Uh, so you have to first figure out how fast that car is and then decide, uh, you know, what its capabilities are, you know, depending on the campaign or the thing you're trying to communicate. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. So one more, maybe we can go back to the, the next question here. That was, I just want to make sure that I didn't get lost as we move on to different topic is, can you recommend the most effective business wire service for digital health startups? Yeah, uh, and I don't want to get in trouble with any of my contacts at the wire mm -hmm. services, but uh, I'm, I'm going to use the word commodity. Um, there's like three, right? And so, uh, you know, it's um, they all pretty much reach the same audiences. You can you can trick a few out to to optimize social, um, but for the most part, it's what you do with that news. So, for instance. I am less concerned about the wire service I'm using on a piece of news as opposed to uh, have we gone to the right reporters? Um, are we going to get the kind of media coverage that we want? Do we want to give an exclusive? And if so, to whom? How much time do we need? The, the distribution of the news itself is almost tactical, right? Uh, because, because those wire services for the most part are commoditized, the top three. It's then, do we have the reporter at the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or what have you? Do they have what they need for that story to be timed? And is it, and is it communicating what we want? Or, or you know, do we have the, the broadcast interview set up? That, those are the things that I worry about more than the wire service itself. Um, you know, once you're a public company, obviously, you know, there are very strict rules on from a reg FD standpoint of what you need to do. And I think it's, you can't go wrong with any, any of the core three wire services. Uh, and they're about the same in price. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, um, you know, what you're saying is like the, you know, what reporter, the, what media yeah. to reach out to, it kind of, again, reminds me of when I was at Hartford, our product was in the TV series, Chicago. Yeah. And yeah. very exciting. Everybody got excited. And I noticed now I don't see that many devices company, you know, actively pursuing that route. And if you look at a company that is fail miserably, Theranos, I think they did a really nice job in hyping themselves up. Yeah. So they can raise that money. And of course, that's not the right It just way. has to work. Yeah. That right. always helps. Yeah. Right. So, uh, it almost feel like if you back it up with make sure that it works, there's so much power. Yes. In you know bringing your story out and how do you convince? I mean, you're lucky that you're saying that your leadership understand the power of communication, and how do you sometimes convince uh, the board who can say like, hold on, you know, I think you're not ready. Let's be stealth here. Um, what are the things that you it's know? A great question. Right. Uh, yeah, having to, having had to have a lot of those conversations with leadership teams and boards, you have to really walk them through your strategy, right? And you can't make it too complex. You have to you have to walk them through how the process is going to happen, and the reward, right? The coverage, the cadence, the things it's going to hopefully enable us to do as a company, and the risks. If you're not willing to assume uh, assume the the risk of a story not being perfect, um, you know, of, of something not going the way you want, then 
then it's probably not for you, but then you run the risk of, of not being in the conversation as well. You know, go back to your very early question on golf. Here, here's one lesson I learned that correlated to PR. Out of the thousands of round of golf I played probably in my life, I can count on one hand the number of times I ever stepped on a first tee and felt I absolutely have everything locked in. It almost never happens. It almost never happens in PR. And so it, the, 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 the venture capitalists, the board members, the executives that can embrace that level of uncomfortableness and, and risk sometimes with engaging with third party and media and influencers that are going to have their own questions and their own viewpoints, that's the, also the value in why you want that coverage is, is the reader understands that a reporter at the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or what have you is, is asking more pointed questions, right? And, and, and they've done their due diligence on a company, you would, you would hope. And if that company then garners that kind of awareness and doesn't live up to that, well, you mentioned a company earlier of, of what happens. Um, so there is a, there is a, a need to, to, when you're a communicator, it's not just communicating with investors and media, it's communicating with your own teams on what you're trying to do and also being very forthright with them on the speed in which you're about to go. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I think Lavongo is a good example. We would, we did, I want to say, Christine, between March of last year and June, about 290 media and investor interviews in, in, in that time frame, which is, which is unheard of. Um, that takes a full commitment of your executive team, of your board, of your product team, certainly of, of my team that worked almost day and night because we felt it was paramount to be communicating how Livongo was helping people navigate a pandemic in relation to folks with chronic conditions uh, that were using our, our, our various solutions. Uh, and so that was something we really committed to, but, but that's easier said than done, right? You really have to Oh, almost over communicate internally as to what you plan to do and how you plan to do it. Um, so and I think that time oh. when you tell that story to the media, because pandemic, when it happened to March, I'm sure at that time, Livongo didn't think about pand pandemic no. before March. And when you tell that story, did you have all your ducks in a row? No, not even close. So again, that goes back to, uh, we, we had worked so hard and had such very strong relationships with analysts and, and media that we knew, right? It goes back to that car with the levers. We knew what our engine could do, right? It, we were still figuring out though, the, the landscape as was everyone else. Um, and so what we didn't want to do is find ourselves in a position where we were not telling our story and our point of view on various topics uh, as we had built, we had built um, this capability and, and so it was being comfortable, being uncomfortable. In fact, Glenn gave a, a talk this morning uh, where he talked exactly about that, about finding comfort and being okay in an environment where you're not comfortable with everything being um, in order. And that again, goes back to your earlier questions on when is the right time to start talking you know, about your company and what you do. Um, if, if, I think if you wait, uh, for everything to be perfect or almost perfect, you probably already lost, you know? Mm -hmm. So let's go back to some of the question that we have from the list, uh, the audience. This is twofold question. He said the word reporter is rapidly changing with the media landscape. How do you decide who you work with? And second, what is your best recommendation for media relations and how do you land meaningful stories? Yeah, well, I kind of live by the motto of, you know, I still live by this of like, pick up the phone. Uh, I don't think that ever really goes out of style, but I, I, I've been, uh, I'm old enough and have been in the industry enough to, to know two worlds. There was a day, Christine, believe it or not, that I would write a press release I'd print out the press release. I'd walk down to the mail room at my agency. I'd fold it up. I'd put a picture of the product. I'd use a stamp machine. I'd mail it to an editor. 
or a reporter. I'd wait two days and I'd call and say, hey, did you get it? And I'd see if it would get into the magazine, you know, in a couple of weeks. So those days are obviously gone. But what has not gone out of style is the fact that influencers, reporters are still human beings. You know, we still need to learn to and, and, and communicate. And you need to appreciate that they have deadlines, right? They're trying to create content. They have bosses. And so trying to meet a reporter or an influencer halfway, it can't always be, I need you or want you to write this story because it's completely beneficial to me and my company and not fully appreciating where the reporter or the influencer might be coming from. Again, I was, I was trained early on, and this is back in Boston, um, by, by ex-reporters. So I, was, I didn't know how fortunate I was at the time that I, I was trained by folks that, from the Boston Globe and other places that you got to see how they thought about PR and dealing with companies, what they liked, what they didn't like, how, how a story literally came to be inside of a newsroom, how the editing process happened. And then from my vantage point, I, I kind of had a, a, a behind the scenes look at how you might want to work with reporters. Um, how you work with them, whether it's email or a phone call or a text, um, you know, that, that would all be predicated on the individual. But, but what can never be up for debate is, are you proactive in, in talking and communicating with influencers? They are the conduit, mm -hmm. whether it's on a blog or a newspaper or a magazine or a video, to telling your story. Um, so what ends up happening and, and I hope people can appreciate what ends up happening are companies, they get together and they get in a room and they talk about their story and how, how what they're doing is really neat and really cool. And they write, a, a, they write a, they write a plan. And then sometimes they put it on a PowerPoint and it's got animation and all sorts of cool stuff. And they say, this is it. This is our plan. And they, they track reporters and influencers and who's doing what on social media. And while that's all going on, the world's going on, they're writing stories. And no one's actually either picked up the phone, email, text, call, done something to find out where that reporter's at mm -hmm. or that influence. What interests them? What information are they looking for? Maybe it's not even about you, but it's something you could help them with. It's building a rapport, um, understanding they have families and bosses and deadlines. Um, that, that fundamental media relations skill set, I don't think has gone out of style. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I think it might come back. It might be like the, the Jordache jeans that are coming back now in style, I see. So, you know, who knows? Maybe, maybe we'll all get back on the phone at some point. So you mentioned earlier on your Boston experience that you understand, it helped you understand what are the things that reporters are looking for. What are they looking for? They're looking for stories that are, yeah. um, that are balanced. So and that's a great question. So let me take it to Lavago. It's a good example. What Lavonga was doing was not unique from a macro standpoint. People with diabetes or hypertension and, in, and health plans and employers trying to control the costs around that was not new. What was new was the way Lavongo was going about it and trying to create an experience for the person living with that condition day in, day out, so it wasn't as bad and they could live their life, right? So if the reporter is looking to write about uh, the, the cost overruns on uh, employers or health plans trying to manage these, these conditions, you would probably have to meet that reporter at where she's trying to write and try to offer her a point of view um, rather than lead with getting her to write necessarily all about Lavongo. Is that If that makes sense, right? I mean, it, it, it is somewhat of a, of a give and take um, because, the, you know, what most people envision to be PR is what, what you'd call vanity PR, right? Like profile pieces, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and when people read those things and we all have seen them, it doesn't have the same impact or effect on us um, because we kind of can tell that yeah. it's somewhat of a fluff piece. Um, so the stories that I like to read are the ones that are pretty balanced and even are what I would call a question mark story, right? Um, you know, can this company do it? Here are the barriers. Um, and you have to be okay with that. A company has to be okay with, if you're going out with a new idea or new concept, well, it's okay for people to question whether it's going to work. Mm -hmm. Right. And you have to be comfortable with that. 
So are you saying that when about you know profile article is more like you go talk to the reporter or understand the reporters that they are interested in setting up the story and how you can fit into the story that they're trying to tell. That, yeah. There's that. There's um, there's all sorts of ways, but yeah, in that in that scenario, yeah, that would be, you know, we once you start getting that media relations engine revving. What ends up happening is you get all sorts of reporters. If you're doing what we call data-based PR, right? You're grabbing some of your own data and that allows you to, to inject your narrative or point of view. And then reporters start to look at you as a resource. And that's when you really know you're, you're doing some, some neat things because they're working on a story and they say, hey, Lavongo, hey, Athena Health, I saw that you put out some information a while ago on X, Y, and Z. Would you be willing or able to get me information on this for this story that I'm working on, right? Now you become a very valuable resource. And then what ends up happening is you've cultivated a relationship with that reporter that you've helped her or him execute what they need to do. And then when you have news, they may probably will be more uh, attuned to listening to you, um, right? So it's, it's more about human interaction than it is about media relations. Yeah. So- Going back to like, what kind of data that sure. we said about? In the case of Athena Health, let me give you a good example. Um, at that time, 2005, 2006, uh, there weren't a lot of companies, believe it or not, that had everybody on one web-based platform. And we had all of our doctors on one platform. And we knew at the time that doctors were very upset at health insurers. Shocker. Right? They felt that they weren't paying them on time. And we had all this claims information. And we thought, what if we take this de-identified claims information and we rank all the payers in the country that Athena Health was doing business with at the time on these seven metrics of how easy or hard a health insurer made it for a doctor to get paid. And we released that information to the world. Mm -hmm. right? And not only did we get the initial press coverage on that, right? And remember at the time, doctors were getting sliced and diced on cost and quality and they were upset. So we kind of flipped the, flipped the script on them and then by proxy became the advocate for the doctor, right? Finally a vendor that, that gets my pain. But as other reporters saw that and that data that they had never seen before, they said, gosh, I'm working on this story or that story where I could leverage that kind of data. And then Athena became a provider of that information. They became a resource for reporters. And that just builds over time. Lavongo did the same thing with, with, with our de-identified um, member data or insights that we were getting and how people were managing their conditions. What was working? What wasn't working? Um, you know, that, that's invaluable to a reporter or to an influencer. It's, it's, it's just raw content. So when you have that data information, you do it more as a press release or you talk to the reporter that do a profile story on the we data? Do it all. We do it. If, it. if it warrants a press release, then then we might consider that. It could be ideal for a blog or some kind of content in that regard. It could be a one-off where maybe we have something really specific that we know a specific reporter would be interested in and we package that up for her. Um, but, but, you know, we make a decision based on, on what we have. But we, we, would, we would have all those different levers that we would want to, to pull depending on what the data is. Mm -hmm. It could also be as simple as a reporter says, hey, I'm working on XYZ story. I'm on deadline at five. Do you have a data nugget on X, Y, and Z? And, you know, then you, then you ask your data science team if they can grab that quick. And, and then you want it attributed to your company kind of thing. So it could be as, as kind of low level as that. So the other thing that when people think about communication and sometimes, so, you know, we talk a lot about external, I think there's also important to have the internal communication. Yes. And how do you, because you've done, well, you have to do both. And what makes a good internal communication and why is that so important? Great question. So I think internal communications is just as critical as external communications, because think about it. If you're, if you're ramping up external awareness, your employees see it and you want them to fully understand what you're saying, why you're saying it, when you're going to say it. And as a company scales, and I've been obviously part of this many times, and you're getting closer to, let's say, an IPO, 
internal communications is critical uh, to your employees um, as to what the company's doing and what its plans are. And every company is a little different, right? And how it views that. It, a lot of it's predicated on the culture of the company. I've always been very fortunate to work at very transparent companies, very open cultures, uh, which, which can present unique challenges for a communications person, right? Especially as you're public. Um, but, you know, you would have an internal team that you're working in concert with, obviously HR and legal, right? And, and I would rather over-communicate internally than under-communicate. Um, you never want any group of employees feeling uh, that they're not in the loop, you know, to the degree that they can be in the loop. Um, and um, you certainly want to create an environment that if they have ideas or feedback, I mean, we would do some, we would do some press work, Christine, that not all of the employees would agree with, for instance. Well, you want to hear about that. You know, you want, they have opinions on that. Certainly when we at Lavongo, for instance, we were very, very focused on diversity and inclusion. And a lot of what we said externally, uh, the genesis of that was internal meetings and town halls and discussions that helped us as a culture, as a company, really create our voice on, on our views on, on diversity and inclusion. Um, so it actually becomes, if, if PR is, is done that way in that regard, it becomes a real asset to the culture, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, but you can't, you can't get the story done if you haven't built the, the muscle memory that we talked about earlier, right? So it is this like chicken and the egg thing. Uh, because again, there's no shortage of companies that have internal meetings and talk about things and have great ideas. And, and do you have the, the, the capability to go, you know, have that told? Yeah. So I think the other part, like, you know, so communicating to your internal, uh, the employees and external, the other piece in healthcare, you know, so important to garner support from key opinion leaders. And how, how do you do that? Have you done that in the past, obviously? Uh, using communication to attract. Yeah, things. yeah, yep. You, you know, it depends on what what kind of opinion leaders or influencers you're talking about. But certainly, there's all sorts, and they would be a major public that you would be communicating with. It could be on the policy front. It could be on the consultancy front. Uh, and each one is a bit nuanced, obviously, and in, in what interests them, uh, what's important to their world. So. You know, when we talk about things like putting out a press release, that is that is one, you know, quiver, uh, you know, in your 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 backpack there for your bow and arrow. I mean, it's there's all different ways to get to get a message out. And then when you have the ability to get that message out, you have to craft that and nuance it for for various, um, you know, stakeholders. And you certainly if you're trying to build advocacy, you know, you want there's a lot of time that goes into educating different audiences as to your point of view on a topic. And you've got, again, you've got to be committed to that as a culture. Um, understanding too, that um, if, you, if you spend those cycles educating policy folks, influencers, media, analysts, investors, you may not see the result of that right away. And you have to be okay with that too. We would spend a lot, all my companies, certainly Longo we would spend an absorbent amount of time with a reporter, for instance, educating them as to what the company does, why we're doing what we do, how we view certain things. And there may not be coverage that comes from that right away, right? Your executive has to be okay with that. You've had, you've had to, would have had to have done a good job communicating to your executive, this is why we wanna to talk to this person, right? Here's why we wanna cultivate this relationship. And it may not result in earned media right away, but it will be beneficial for us down the road in this way or that way. Um, so I consider that as much internal communication uh, as, as the traditional sense of, of you know, talking to your employees, of, of really understanding why you need to tell your executives or spokespeople why they're doing something and why is it beneficial to the company um, short term and long term. So it sounds like you have to kind of build that relationship with the reporter. Yeah. Because the first conversation doesn't always land in a story, but at least they hear about you and then they see your story, they build 
they see how you build your story and then at some point they'll be ex excited with your story and that's when they cover it is that well that's the hope and 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 uh spoiler alert there's going to be a day where you don't have good news there's going to be you know not so great weeks um so you know the more um the more reporters and influencers that you have spent time with and you have answered questions, you know, and you've helped them, just as human beings, they probably are going to be more uh, attuned to listening to you when maybe some tough times have hit the company or the organization. Mm -hmm. so, so keep that in mind too, right? If, you, yeah. if you've created a PR culture of, uh, you, you know, closure, um, and, or lack of access, or you haven't been doing a proactive job telling your story, um, well, then you can't expect those same folks that you haven't worked that much with to then all of a sudden know who you are and what you're doing and cover you the right way when maybe some not so great news has come your way. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, like when you're a startup, uh, when you're ready for the PR, um, having somebody who are experienced, they have the relationship already with the reporter. Like in your case, I'm sure you have your Rolodex, is, you know, you know. I still use a Rolodex, I'm kidding. No, I actually, I've moved to my phone. I'm not that that analog. I, I do no longer have my Rolodex. Yeah, so at what point as a startup, they need to bring somebody in house or work with an, 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 an agency who has the Rolodex, who can help yeah. them go out there and tell their story on their behalf. That's a good what question. It's a qu Yeah. Well, you need something. Let's start there, right? You're going to like, is, if you're committed to, you know, communication, you're either going to need somebody in-house that knows what they're doing and that can maybe build an in-house team, or you're going to need an agency that knows what they're doing. I, I, uh, I've done it both ways. Um, and um, uh, I, I think um, depending on the, the, the evolution of a company when you say startup, right? If they're an upstart, right? They've got real revenue and uh, they have real investors. Yeah, you want to invest in an in-house comms person or two. Uh, you want to start building that capability to tell your own story. And if you then need help and bandwidth, you might want to go out and get uh, an agency. I have a list of like not many agencies that I use. And the agencies I use are individuals I've known a long, long time. Because one of the traps that happens to startups is um, there's no shortage, shocker, of PR agencies. Mm -hmm. And all of them, unsurprisingly, are going to tell you they can tell your story really well. But what happens is um, they come in, oftentimes, all well-meaning, and it takes two, three, four months to get them up to speed. And then they start doing work. Right. And at that point, you're spending money on that agency and the internal team is saying, well, where's the results? And you've just spent two, three, four months coming up with that wonderful PowerPoint or presentation we talked about earlier. And now you're ready to put it into into play, um, whereas opposed to if you have an in-house team, they're living and breathing that every day. Uh, they're 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 talking to the product folks, the data anal analysts, the, the executives. Um, and so I, I've always been um, uh, more on the, the build the in-house capability side and use very specific agencies as you need them that are, that are super specialized. You know, for instance, with the merger, we use an agency that that's all they do, right, is, is when, when, you, when you're going through a merger like that, you would need, one, you don't want to miss anything that needs to get done, right? And there's a thousand things that need to get done. But that's all they do. They don't. They don't pretend to do everything. And so you would. You would. You would know who to call in that regard. You know. So. So that. Um, and I get that question all the time from friends and colleagues and 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 uh, VCs that I know of of smaller companies that are trying to weigh that. Um, and it's the right. It's the right question to have. But but the short answer is as long as you've committed that you need PR and comms, that's step one. It's like admitting you have a problem, step one. Like we need PR and comms. Okay, then, then, then you have that discussion of, do we, do we hire an in-house person, right? Typically at a startup, just to finish this up, yeah, you're probably not gonna get you know, the, the seasoned veteran with that 
those those contacts, but you're also going to need that person that that is willing to dig in and really work hard and understand and build that narrative, and then maybe augment that with with an agency and a small retainer. So, but how does it work when you're like in a startup? Your team is lean. You don't have that much money, and you do not need a PR. And the CEO founders they don't have that experience in a PR. And how can they land somebody like you who has a lot of experience and who's willing to, uh, you know, find the story and then commit? Well, I'm locked up. I'm. I'm. Uh, locked Glenn, up. Glenn Tolman's drafted me. I'm. A, I'm in a long-term contract. Um, but. Uh, I, I do advise some Asian, uh, some companies, and uh, I, I think um, I think it's it's a it's a really strategic hire. You know, you really you've got to view communications as a uh, not a check the box activity. We have a person that does comms. You know, really view them as a strategic member of the team. And if there is a really seasoned communications pro, they're going to sense that and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to really be have an influence at this company. And I want to join this company because I'm going to be able to do and say and craft some campaigns that I would want to do. Um, so I think if, if the a team uh, positions, you know, communications from a strategic standpoint, you're probably going to attract a different candidate um, mm-hmm. than maybe somebody just starting out in their career. Right. So what, I want to go back to some of the question here, um, which I uh, relevant to what we're talking about. They want to know how big was your team uh, and what capabilities did you bring in to build that content engine? Is this at Lavongo? I guess let's let's start with Lavongo. How big was your Lavongo team? was a tiny team. It's it's shocking to people given the volume right of of the coverage. It was myself. It was uh, Jake, uh, who I mentioned earlier. It was a, a woman named Ashley Barris said, um, and then we built it out a little bit. We used no outside agencies. We had, uh, we had. Uh, it's exhausting saying this, by the way, because now it's bringing back like the memories of the just the volumes of work. But, but it was a very lean, mean team, and um, we built an engine there, Christine, that I'm I was I'm very proud of, um, because we. We had all the levers, you know, we had, we had events, we had thought leadership, we had the social media, we certainly had earned media and we could, we could pull these things as needed and it all worked together. Um, but that really comes from Glenn. Okay. Uh, and, and Dr. Jennifer Schneider and others that understood the need to have strategic communications capabilities at Lavago, that that was going to be a differentiator. And as long as they were a thousand percent committed to what we wanted them to do and they were willing to do it, uh, then it was really go get it done. And so that's why that team was, was small, but so effective. Uh, we did not have a lot of layers. Um, that's oftentimes what can happen. So, so, and that was partly my job to make sure there were no layers, you know, the, the, the layers that needed to be there were there. And otherwise we were off and running and we were, we were executing every day. If we weren't telling some kind of story or putting out some content, I think that team would all tell you that that we kind of didn't feel like we did anything effective that day. Um, so it was it was a twenty four uh, by seven uh, kind of uh, environment for sure. So do you have some sort of a framework in terms of how to do the planning and the executing? I mean, yeah. ha- having a lean team doing so much work. Do you have like a playbook that you've done that now you carried, you know, every company that you are at? I keep, I keep, I feel like you keep trying to make me be like this analog guy. Yeah. I have like a playbook. No, I, I have, I have an idea of, uh, of what needs to get done depending on where the company's at. Um, you know, and, and a lot of those candidly, a lot of that comes from failures, right? So things that I thought I, I was super smart and had it figured out, you know, and then found myself in awkward situations where uh, I didn't have it figured out. And so, um, you know, with Livongo, it was it was very similar to Athena. We had a short amount of time to build awareness and market understanding of what we who we were and what we were doing before we had to go public. Uh, and so, yeah, there is a, a set game plan of things that absolutely need to occur. And then we'll we'll fill it in as we go. 
Yeah, no, that, that's uh, that's cool. And so, uh, and with the transparent now, yeah. I have two minutes, uh, one minute before. Uh, what is, um, I guess maybe some people don't know what transparent I should have sure. asked uh, earlier. Um, what are the things that you try to achieve with your uh, media? Yeah, I failed. I should have folded it in, pivoted, right? So there, there's, there's, there's a lesson, talking points. Um, transparent was really born out of the idea that, that if you're an employer right now, and in turn, their employees, you have so many different digital health solutions uh, available to you. Some work, some don't. Uh, that there needs to be a, a new experience uh, capability on behalf of the employer to offer these solutions. Surgery is where we're starting, right? And we'll go to other areas that enable the employee to have a successful experience using these solutions, right? And that's not a navigator, an aggregator, or a website where they all live, right? That That's... That's how we viewed it at Livongo, right? It was a it, it was a seamless experience and had a manager diabetes. So now take that and, and look to all the other kinds of solutions that an employer um, well-meaning is trying to roll out to their populations. Um, and that that you know, Transcaren is going to be the, the provider of that. Okay. So with you know, I, I keep we going can talk to- a, lot, a lot more about it, but yeah, but yeah, yeah, that is that is the 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 a quick yeah no th- thank you for sharing that one last question before we wrap up is about you know you know a lot of our listeners tend to be startup when they don't have enough funding and is there any risk of running into you know doing it yourself and you know make make a mistake and then it just ruin everything in your meet uh, 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 so the risk of doing it by yourself and screwing up right right Sure, there's, you know, you screw up all the time, but but again, it goes back to, I'd rather try it, see if it works and screw up than not have done it at all. So if, if you've got a startup and it, you're bootstrapping that thing and it, you're not even to series A, well, you're not gonna get to series A if no one knows you exist. And if you get to a series A and you got a bunch of investors looking at you and they Google you and no one's heard of you, it's probably gonna make for an uncomfortable pitch. Right. So you got to get out there. You got to use all the 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 assets available to you to tell your story to the best degree you can, given where you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and everyone's a little different, but but never let it be. You didn't do it because you were afraid or so risk adverse that you became paralyzed because then you will just fall in line to the the plethora of companies that uh, were well-meaning, super smart and and didn't make it right so well that's great well thank you so much it's great to be here this was super fun yeah thank you so much